Why did you want to be an artist? Boy, I have no idea. I wanted to be a surgeon. When I was in World War II, I was a surgical technician. I hit a beachhead, set up an emergency thing, and then I disappeared and woke up in Pearl Harbor. So I wanted to be a lot of things, like every young lad does. And But a surgeon, I discovered I had a brain when I was in the Navy. I was ADD, but they didn't have a term for it at that time. I couldn't read until I was 14. And my mother was going with some economics guy, and he said, let's give the kid an IQ test. And I heard, after the IQ test, I heard my mother crying and using the word moron. <laughs> so here I am, kids. <laughs> Bob Graham had an interesting story one day. I was over visiting, and his, his son said uh, uh, he'd been having some problems with his dad. And I said, what's that, Stephen? He said, well, every time I want to do something, he says, no, it's this way and that way. And he said, Dad, what is this problem we have? And he said, Stephen, you don't understand. It's all about me. <laughs> And I think this is typical of artists. It's all about them. What is that root from? Where does that come from? Where do artists come from? Why are we spending all this time in these universities trying to produce career artists? When I taught at Irvine many, many years ago, the students always came up to me and wanted to know how they were going to make it. And I said, well, just do what you do and not worry about that. Of course, we all want to make it. We all want to be rich and famous. And there is the rub. And I think about, well, what is the origin of the artist? And I, I started going further and further back in time until primitive man and the first tribal art. Who were these people that did these things? They often slept in a different tent they rubbed sticks together, they made images that were sort of like metaphors of the terror of existence. Is that what the artists are now? Is it about entertainment? Is it about uh, drama? What is it about and why are we doing it? And I think somewhere it was, it's in the genetic code. Are we doing this to be professionals? I'm against professional artists. I'm against career artists. I'm against the idea of doing it for money. So all of these people are trained in these art schools and everybody is getting money. Now we need to enrich our culture. We don't need to make professional artists and career artists. They come out of the woodwork. They come between the cracks. Can artists be made? I think not. Can they be enriched? I think that's a possibility. But I don't paint paintings for myself. I'm, I'm against the idea of expressing myself, being creative. That's another word I really hate. Who do you paint for? I paint for you all. And so... What I do is to make these paintings to be seen, and they're like metaphors of life. I feel that a, a real person that does this taps into his existence. Now you can tap in like Andy Warhol to talk about the culture and reflect on the culture, the images of the culture. I'm an abstract painter. I don't know what they are. I, I move around. I'm an explorer. I never hang with, once I find an image I really like, I don't keep mining it. I move on to the next thing and the next thing. So people say, well, you change so much, Ed. I say, I never change, I mutate. <laughs> One thing sets off the next thing, which is the next thing, which is the next thing. Why do you paint on the ground? You didn't always. I used to paint up on an easel. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I just like moving around. What I do is every day I have eight or ten canvases stretched up. They're stretched over a wood panel. I hose them all down so they're wet. 
and before they dry, I start introducing paint to it. So this thing sort of happens and the images come out of it. I like the idea that they're apparitional. It's like looking at the clouds and you think you see a bear or a tiger and then it disappears. So I don't paint bears. I paint canvas. People say, well, what do you paint? I say, I paint canvas. And then we'll see what happens. And sometimes the series will come out. And once it, it's there, then I'm off to the next thing. And this, a corner of each painting suggests another possibility. How many paintings have you made? One or two thousand, somewhere. In, but I destroy, oh, 80 percent. Why? Because they don't pass the test. If they look good and they look like an Ed Moses, and let's, they shake the rattles for me, I don't keep them. Often, I'm embarrassed. I'll have an exhibit, and I don't know until the exhibit takes place, oh my God, why did you include that painting? And that's happened. A, a great story once, I, I had a show with uh, uh, Emmerich in New York. Everything sold out of that show. And the Modern found out about it, a guy named Kenneth McShine came in, and there was one that I was really embarrassed, and it was sort of ditched way back, and I said, but it sort of balanced out the symmetry of, of the exhibit. So I left it in there. He picked that one, and I kept, I usually try to keep one that I really like aside, because I like to refer to it. So I, I called Andre and I said, Andre, the painting I kept aside, let's give him that for the modern. He said, uh, he called Keniston and Keniston said no, he was very proud of the one that he selected. So I said, oh God, what am I going to do? So then they hung it in the foyer of the old modern of new acquisitions. So I called Keniston and I said, unless you take that down, I'm going to go in with the razor blade and slash it right off the wall. Well, I never heard from the modern again after that. <laughs> Why do you personally think that Los Angeles and Los Angeles artists were overlooked internationally for so many years? Because it's Hollywood. This is Hollywood. No one believed that anything could come out of here. I moved to New York when I was a younger artist and I just didn't feel comfortable there. It was all set up for artists. LA was never set up for artists. It isn't until now that people were all celebrating each other. The Pompidou happened. It's all about publicity, is it not? It's all about coverage. And the more that the artists are coveraged, the more curious the people outside of that. Think the film industry. We learned about the film industry because they are all about publicity. And people don't go to films unless they're publicized. And once in a while we find one that seeps out of the cracks like some of the artists do. In spite of the publicity, every once in a while, for some inexplicable reason, they appear. Uh, you were very reticent about being part of this exhibition. Can you tell me why? I certainly can. I hate shows like this. I call them gangbang shows because they have a little bit of everybody and nothing in particular about anybody. However, this show was a surprise to me. Uh, Lynn came over and brought the woman that was the... Uh, Chief curator. Chief curator. Chief curator there, and she was a cold fish, no smiles, no nothing. And as soon as I met her, it was easy for me to respond. I won't tell you how I responded. I just <laughs> told her I didn't want to be in your so-and-so show. He's really cleaned up his act. <laughs> <laughs> and Lynn sort of laughed and tried to soften the, the situation. So we looked around at my studio at various paintings, etc., etc., and they all left. And then I heard from Lynn a little bit later that, yes, they wanted to include me. 
So I said, oh. So anyway, I decided to go, and then I had a rationalization that I could go because, after all, I was having a show there. So it was quite an event. It was a magnificent event. The exhibition looked great. Uh, I was very unhappy about that. I expected it to look terrible. And the layout, this woman did a fantastic job. She's moved out of that position, I understand. And she came to me and said, uh, I understand you're not satisfied with the way your painting is hung. I said, yes, it's hung vertically and it's supposed to be horizontal. <laughs> So she said, well, would you like us to change it? And I said, no, a really great abstract painting. There is no top and no bottom because you move around in a circle while you're painting it. The Leiden exhibition was, what would you do with their collection? So I walked into the stacks and where they store all the specimens and looked at everything to see if I could conjure up some idea and or response and I noticed how they were all stuffed on these shelves all these various specimens so what I did was say bring them all out right the way they're stored in this huge room and it was like a zoo I put chicken wire all around them some red lights on top of these and there was two huge long lines of all these specimens of lions and tigers and ostriches sticking their heads out and some up on top and then there was a, a big mound in the city and I wanted to do rats that was my original thing because Holland is notorious for rats they sent them out all over the world with their early explorers <laughs> and the plague and all these associations. So I made a huge rat mound as high as this thing here is. And they had two or three hundred specimens of rats. And they were all laying there and they're, they're horrifying creatures. I know women particularly dislike them. And uh, their babies have their ears chewed off and I think it goes way back. And then a quarter of the pie, I cut out and inside of that I painted it black and I put some bats in there but I couldn't get them to light it properly they wanted to illuminate and I wanted you to discover this mound they were going to cover this mound with bear skins but the bear skins were too stiff so they wouldn't cover the mound I made an armature out of chicken wire and wood and things like that and so there all these rats were, but they were illuminated. And I wanted you to get up to it and then go, ugh. There they were. And a lot of it was, I was thinking of an audience. I often don't, I try not to think of an audience when I'm paint. But children, the children really are the most fascinated by natural history museums. I know as a kid, I, I was raised in Long Beach. And I used to go to the county museum and see all the dioramas and all the things. So they've been trying to get people to go to the Natural History Museum. So they got the bright idea of getting some artists to respond. And they've done a, a really amazing job. Lynn can tell you more about that, being a viewer and not being a participant. So it all sort of fed in because I, was, I went to Bubur and then I went to Leiden to install this thing. I'd gone there earlier and then back again and then I had a show. So it was sort of a, a triangulation that I fulfilled. A person by the name of John Nava came to me uh, oh, two or three years ago and he did the tapestries for the new Catholic uh, cathedral. cathedral. And he said, would you be one of the characters? So it ended up I was St. Thomas. The oh, Doubting Thomas, perfect, casting. right. <laughs> so then about, oh, not even a year ago, he came to me and he said, Ed, I've decided that I'm going to invite artists to do these tapestries. And the next time you're in Ojai, he lives in Ojai, come by. So I, I, I have an ex-wife that lives in Ojai. So we were visiting and we went over to see John Nava. 
in his studio and he had this giant Chuck Close Philip Glass uh, tapestry. And it was magnificent. And I said, wow, look at that. He said, would you like to do some? And I said, yeah, but, you know, I don't do designs for tapestries. He said, well, we will photograph one of your paintings. We send it. There's a technique called the jacquard that goes way back. It was sort of like player pianos where they punch little holes, and they could do that with the weaving to tell uh, where the different threads go and working out the whole pattern. A guy like Jack Hart in 1800 devised this technique before it was all by hand. And so they could do it with this weaving device. So we sent a, a photograph and back comes this weaving and I was bowled over. They're better than the paintings. I said, God, I looked at it in my studio and he sent two more and I hit them in the studio. And the wonderful possibility it was a collaboration. It wasn't all about me. It was Nava, this weaving company in Belgium where they make these things, and they are extraordinary. The thing is, from a distance, they look like these paintings, a series of paintings I call magna paintings. And uh, when you get within 10 feet, you start to see these things glow with all these various threads that are gold and silver, et cetera, et cetera. Ed, will you talk for a couple minutes about what it feels like to be a shaman? You know, the thing is we're a separate breed. We look like humans. We do some things like humans. We wear clothes. But it's a different, it's a different enterprise. Not, enterprise not in the financial sense that everybody does things that has to do with business and it's all oriented. Is there any possibility of doing something that isn't about that, that doesn't have that goal, that doesn't have a goal of fame and fortune? And these are these guys. And what happened is in the tribal sense, when the tribes were broken up, there was still, there were so many in each tribe usually one. I always say there can only be one magic man in a tribe. So all the artists get together because they have this in common. But they have difficult times. Ego clashes. Metaphysical clashes. So when these tribes broke up, the genetic code was still there and they were thrown out willy-nilly. And they had no father. They had no teacher. They had to come up with a way of interfacing. Then it became a profession. When I was a young artist, I remember I came home one weekend to visit my mother. She was very active in politics of Long Beach. And she was having a little tea party. And she said, uh, Edward, would you join us? I was home from UCLA. I was a student at that time. And she said, uh, tell Tell us all what you do, Edward. She says, oh, Edward is an artiste. She said, you're not a pansy, are you? She was ruthless. Yeah, right. <laughs> Mother's off and on. <laughs> so the thing of being an artist at that time, even now with most of our middle class and ambitious ambition, how are you going to make a living? Women could do it because they were going to be married. So it was okay for girls to take art classes at that time. It's probably changed and modified a great deal now. But anyway, that's our route. We have that genetic thing. Now how do we interface? Well, most of us do it with madness and neurosis. But once in a while, one of us hits a kind of little groove and we do this weird little thing shake the rattles in some way.